Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. We appreciate your time today and we're eager to share some important information about the Modular Housing Development Fund request for applications. My name is Britt McLean and I'm an uh, operations and policy analyst here at OHCS. Joining me today is Holly Oglesby, one of our procurement and contract specialists here at OHCS. Just a few things before we get started, please make sure your mic is muted. Uh, we'll take some questions at the end of the presentation, and in the meantime, you're welcome to put your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can today. Those that we can't get to today, we will address later, and we'll post an FAQ document in Oregon Buys. This meeting is being recorded, and we'll also make it available in Oregon Buys as soon as we can. Oh, it looks like the question, the Q&A is turned off, so go ahead and put those in the chat. Sorry about that. We want to emphasize that the information today is the best information we have at the moment, but it is not binding. Dates and details may shift, and it's very important to register in Oregon buys and acknowledge this bid to be notified of any updates. Based on the questions we've received already on this RFA, we will be issuing an addendum to, to issuing an addendum to clarify a few items and make sure that the expectations are clear. We want to highly encourage you to read the RFA and the attachments very closely. All required documents and instructions, uh, scoring criteria are included. And if after the meeting today you still have questions, that's great. We uh, you can reach out to Holly, and we will include her contact info at the end of the presentation. Okay, just to review today's agenda, we're going to first do a little bit of grounding in the Modular Housing Development Fund background and the purpose of the fund. We'll go over the objectives and the grant details. Then we'll cover the application process and the requirements. We'll move on to a, a brief overview on the scoring criteria, but there are, more, there are more details on the scoring criteria specifically in the RFA. We'll then cover award and grant agreement information, how the award will be dispersed, timeline and key dates, and then some next steps. And then finally, we hope to have uh, quite a bit of time at the end for your uh, for your questions. Okay. Okay, so the objectives of the Modular Housing um, uh, Development Fund. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I think I might have skipped one. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. Trying to multitask. The Modular Housing Development Fund was established in House Bill 2001 during the last legislative session. The language can be found at olis.organlegislature.gov. The bill, the bill allocated $20 million in general fund resources. You'll notice that the bill language defers many of the program administration details to OHCS, with the exception of two key pieces. The first is the requirement that activities are pursued with the specific intention to spur production capacity, creation, or expansion. And two, the categories of demand that this new production capacity must prioritize. Local governments after a natural disaster, low income housing development, and middle income housing uh, and middle income uh, housing development. So, so some grant details. The key objectives of the fund around which you're highly encouraged to shape your grant application are these. Oh, wait, oh, I'm sorry. Um, do, 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 do. Yes, there we go. Our goal is to award four grants of about $5 million each. In the event that the agency doesn't receive four eligible applications, we may be open to awarding additional funds to certain applicants. Applicants will have an opportunity to request additional funds and describe proposed capacity expansion activities within their application. Again, applicants must clearly and persuasively outline how their proposed activities uh, will create or expand production capacity. Because these are general fund resources, they must be spent by the end of the legislative biennium, June 30th, 2025. So readiness will be an important component of your proposal. Reporting requirements will continue through June 30th, 2029. The continued impact of these funds on your organization's production capacity and the industry's growth in Oregon as a whole is of really high interest to the legislative sponsors. 
So some examples of eligible grant uses. For those of you who have been following the development of the fund and have participated in our stakeholder engagement sessions, this list will look very familiar to you. So eligible uses include, but are not limited to, increasing your manufacturing space, purchasing a specific piece of equipment, standardizing the design for off-the-shelf uh, off the shelf um, production, developing infrastructure, internal or external, enhancing transportation methods, making advancements in materials and technology. We want to emphasize again that these are just examples and this is not an exhaustive list. You will be asked to include an estimated increase in the number of ongoing units produced from your current baseline operations. These grant funds are meant to spur your operations capacity to increase your ongoing production. So the application itself, a complete application will include four forms. The application, which is included in the package, is attachment C, the Equity Center Management Plan, attachment D, the COVID and MWESB outreach, outreach Plan, which is attachment F, and the Responsibility Inquiry, which is attachment D. Um, some of the forms require signatures, so be sure to watch for that. The application, attachment C, is going to be limited to 25 pages. The other required attachments don't count for that 25 page limit. Um, in addition to these required components, there's a couple of optional ones as well. Um, please review the sample grant agreement attachment A. And if, and if you have any concerns about any of the language in there, you're welcome to note those exceptions and send them as well. You can do that before or during the time that you submit your application. Um, some people do that as a web line document, and some people just provide a more. Um, but please let us know if you have any exceptions to this term. Um, second, if you believe any of your application is exempt from disclosure under Oregon Public Records Law, please provide a redacted application and also uh, the disclosure exemption affidavit, attachment B, which is a document that asks you to tell us what you believe is exempt from that, that disclosure. Thank you, Ollie. Okay, application scoring criteria. A total of 100 points are divided among these criteria. Investment outputs, community and industry impact, category prioritization plan, experience and budget, report your reporting plan, and an equity-centered management plan. Again, the evaluation question associated with these criteria are all included in the RFA, but we'll touch on them briefly here. First, for investment outputs, we're looking to see how the applicant is uh, is going to use these funds, to what extent there is need for the proposed solution, and how would the investment increase or create production capacity. For community and industry impact, we're looking to see what the projected impact on the applicant's organization would be, what the impact on the industry as a whole could be, and what ongoing capacity could be expected for after as a result of this investment. For the category prioritization plan, we want to know how you plan to prioritize the three categories of demand from House Bill 2001. We'll look at how soon applicants expect to be able to meet those prioritization requirements and how you and how applicants will use previous experience, previous experience, if any, with governments and low income and middle income housing development. Applic applications must receive a minimum of eight points to be considered for funding for this specific crit criterion. For experience and budget, we will look at your uh, project budget and how it aligns with the proposed activities, the applicant's track record in the industry, and whether your business plan demonstrates stability and viability over the course of the next five years. For the reporting plan, we will look at your definition of success, what metrics you plan to track that demonstrates that success, and whether you successfully prioritized the demand categories. For the equity-centered management plan, this is a tool to help applicants operationalize their commitments to diversity, equity, and inclusion within their organization. The ECMP document contains five DEI best practices and asks applicants to outline their current successes with any and all of these best practices. We then ask applicants to select three in which they plan to take measurable, actionable steps. Each benchmark has examples of activities associated with it. Equity-centered management plans must receive a minimum of six points to be considered for funding. Those are the uh, the equity-centered management plan and the category prioritization plan are the only two uh, criteria criteria that have a minimum number of points in order to move forward. 
Okay, for award and agreements, applications will be reviewed and scored by a committee uh, of uh, OHCS staff and some selected external partners. The evaluation committee will review uh, applications after the uh, RFA is closed, and then we'll make a selection for awards. The awardees will be notified by procurement staff and then they must meet uh, they must complete a list of requirements in section 6.3 of the RFA before an agreement may be executed and then there are going to be some insurance requirements depending on what your project is okay for the disbursement of award Reimbursement is the best practice, but we know that this is a unique offering, and we know that there may be different types of projects and grantees, so we're open to discussing advanced payment options. Advanced payment requests should be limited to the portions of the project that would require large out outlays or otherwise create cash flow challenges, and we just ask that you flag those in the budget portion of your application. This table represents our overall solicitation schedule. Today's gathering is the free application conference shown in the first row. If you haven't already done so, please be sure to read the RFA and its attachments. If you have questions about the RFA that aren't addressed today, please be sure to email them to me by November 28th at 4 o'clock p.m. That's the date shown in the second row. Um, we'll do our best to provide answers to all questions by December 5th, 2023. Um, our answers will be posted in Oregon buys, and then applications are due on December, by December 15th at 4 o'clock. Um, our goal is to notify every one of our award decisions by January 10th. Uh, next slide. So Oregon buys is a newer procurement system for the state of Oregon. Um, we have a contracted vendor that provides support this is, if you haven't already done so, you'll need to register for access to Oregon Buys. These are the steps to do that. And if you have any trouble along the way, please reach out to, it's called Periscope Holdings, there are them there um, at that email address or phone number, they've listed their support hours as well. Um, in addition to registration assistance, if you have trouble when you go to submit your application or any other trouble in that system, Please do feel free to use the Periscope email address and phone number listed here. And next slide. Uh, as Britt mentioned earlier, we may make changes to the RFA. All of these changes will be posted in Oregon by, so it's very important to them to register for access. And then there's a step in there once you do that that's called acknowledge bid. Um, once you acknowledge the bid in Oregon buys, it will ensure that you're notified of changes as soon as they happen. So that's an important step. And again, um, Periscope is our vendor if you have any trouble with any of those steps. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then we will take a couple of questions from the chat. I'm just gonna review that really quickly and then we can open it up to the um, full group here. So let's just see what we got in the chat. Will the, yes, it will be recorded. Yeah, it is being, it is currently being recorded and will be made available for folks. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please feel free um, to chime in. Okay, am I no longer sharing my screen? Okay, great. Britta, could I ask a question? Sure, Stuart, go ahead. Okay, great. So um, can you talk a little bit more about disbursement? Um, so the awards are January 10th. And um, so what happens after? What do you see happening after that? Um, that might be a Holly question. Um, and okay. January 10th is our, is a, is a goal. So there might, there might right. be a little bit of shifting either way. So I just want to say that, but Holly, um, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. So by January 10th, we hope to send letters to everybody that will come via email, um, and also be post posted in Oregon buys. Um, but just saying, uh, yes, we want to move forward with your application or no, we do not. Um, 
at that time, you'll have, there's a, a protest period of 14 days. The schedule is listed. Uh, uh, we have a an Oregon administrative rule that's cited in there, but I believe the period is 14 days. So if you, if you feel the need to protest that decision, you're free to do so following the process outlined in rule. Um, and after that protest ends, we're we're going, we have a very aggressive timeline. So we're kind of working some of this in parallel, but but we're hoping to have um grant agreements out for your review as soon as that protest period ends. Review on signature. Um thanks, Holly. Do you do you see the disbursement as being a lump sum or um or has there been more thought put to that? Um, so our 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 standard and and what we consider to be a best practice is to uh, provide payment on a reimbursement basis. But uh, as Britt mentioned, this is kind of unique. And so if you have some sort of large capital outlay or some sort of big ticket purchase that that would cause um, cash flow challenges or you would be more successful with a with an advanced payment. We just ask, we're, we're open to discussing that. We just ask that you flag those things in the budget. Okay, thanks, Holly. Okay, we have a couple of questions in the chat, so I'm just gonna go through a couple of those. Uh, does the applicant have to be up and running building modular structures? Uh, UPCS Inventor, do you mind um, speaking a little bit more about what you mean? Okay, we'll come back to that question. I'll just move on to the next one. Uh, let's see, Stephanie asks whether there are page limits to the application. I will turn that over to Holly. Um, yeah, so the RFA doesn't mention this yet. It will, we're going to just issue a clarifying of that then. So thank you to the prospective applicant that pointed that out. Um, the application itself, so when I say that it's attachment C, that will be limited to 25 pages. The other attachments don't count against that 25 page limit. But if you have like a cover page or a table of contents or graphics or things like that, um, those things will count against that 25 page limit. So 25 pages for attachment C. Thank you, Holly. Uh, next question, are you open to teams or joint ventures submitting applications? Uh, I would say uh, yes. Um, and Holly, please chime in here, but I think that uh, even with joint uh, ventures, there will be an entity that is responsible for the reporting that will have to be designated, the person who has to um, secure insurance. Um, so even with joint ventures, there, there will be um, one of the one of the entities will have to um, agree to ensure that reporting happens, that insurance happens. Is that right? Is there anything else you want to add to that, Holly? No, I think that that's perfect. We would have one, we would be entering into an agreement with one entity. And if your application said that you had a joint venture or plans to partner with others, then probably in our grant agreement, you would see something obligating you to do those things that you submitted in your application. Thank you. Great. Let's see, next question in the chat. Would any consideration be given to a business plan that needs time beyond 6 30 25 to use funds, for example, funds to support operations for the first full year. Um, unfortunately, no, funds have to be spent by the end of the legislative biennium. So uh, all funds would need to be spent down, reimbursed uh, and fulfilled by 6-30-25. Uh, let's see, next one. Who participated in the stakeholder engagement sessions and are the recordings and transcripts available to us? Um, there was a long list of folks, so I won't um, I go through them all here, but um, certainly happy to um, share those uh, share those uh, materials. Let's see. Next question. In the RFA, it states that the intent is to increase modular homes and modular home component production capacity. Does the application have to address both the structure and components, i.e. can the applicant that makes casework or panelized walls be eligible even if they aren't fully producing a complete modular home? Great question, Melody. Uh, yes, uh, the the bill and the RFA are intended to um, extend eligibility for complete unit manufacturers and also component manufacturers. So if you 
if you um, manufacture windows specifically for modular homes or some other component that um, uh, that are used in, in modular homes, you are also eligible. So the, the wall, um, the panelized walls that you uh, mentioned that would be eligible. Thank you for that question. That's a important clarification. Um, let's see. Um, I, I forgot to mention we have Rick Rizika, who's the Assistant Director of Planning and Policy here at OHCS in the Affordable Rental Housing Division, and he is going to chime in if I miss anything or mischaracterize anything. So he is, um, he he's he's here he's he's back up. So um, just wanted to flag that for folks. And and Rick, really feel free to chime in if I if I don't um, cover everything. Let's see, the next question here. When it comes to eligible tasks and costs, would educational marketing advertising costs to help increase demand for modular homes be eligible? We see a gap in not only the infrastructure of production, but also just in the understanding of modular homes across Eastern Oregon. Um, I, I would say that it's difficult to um, give a specific answer about a particular um application, I would say if you're able to um the, the, the key here, the, the 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 key sort of um concept we want your applications to be rooted in is how does your investment, how does how do the grant funds expand capacity production capacity? So um if you have an idea for for something how you want to spend these funds the case will have to be made how that activity uh, spurs production capacity. So I would always bring it back to um, back to that idea. Uh, let's see. Okay, so that that is the last question in the chat. Does anybody uh, would anybody like to chime in with additional questions here? There's, and just to reiterate, it's not your last chance. There's one more I think that dropped in, Brett. Oh. Thank you. Uh, oh, I see it from Stephanie. Is this RFA interested in building capacity of landing these modular projects in local jurisdiction or only producing the units or components? Stephanie, would you mind um, saying a little bit uh, more about your question? I think there's some there's an important uh, idea in there and I'm, I'm not sure I'm quite tracking. Sure. So, um, you know, depending on the foundation type of the modular unit, um, it there's a there's a lot that happens once they leave the factory to having them on site. Um, and what we have found in projects is the state needs more people um, beyond your typical general contractor that knows how to land a modular site, a modular project on site because it, it has some nuances. So as we're building the production of these different types of construction, um, there's a there's there's landing the projects. You know, um, each of them connect differently to different utilities and whatnot. So and have different components. So I'm just curious um, if there's technical assistance thought of in this grant, or is it just manufacturing? Is there technical assistance associated with the grant funding? Right. No. Okay. Uh, and and I think the again the activity that you outline, if you, um, I think it would be it, it's important for all applic applicants to make the case that their activities spur production capacity. Okay, let's see, Stuart. Um, can awardees be from out of state? Um, so this is we did a lot of thinking about this. Um, and Rick, this is this is when I would really want you to chime in here if I yeah. mischaracterize this. Um, awardees can be from out of state if they are planning to open operations within the state of Oregon. So if there is a manufacturer in Washington or Idaho um, and they want to open a production facility in Oregon um, and then they agree that they would comply with the prioritization categories for Oregonians, yes but the money is meant to spur capacity expansion and the growth of the modular industry within Oregon. And if that means bringing manufacturers to, to the state and these funds can help do that, then we believe that's an eligible cost, uh, eligible uh, use. Uh, Rick, did I get that right? Yeah, basically the money stays in the state, but you don't have to have your home office within the state. That's a much more succinct mm -hmm. way of saying that. Yes, thank you, Rick. 
Uh, Stuart, does that answer your, your question? It does, Britta, thank you. You bet. Okay, Judy, let's see. Does the applicant have to be up and running building modular structures? We have a working prototype of a class three panelized system that is ready for production, but not up and running producing panels at this time. Uh, Ju Judy, I hesitate to give um, specific guidance either way, but I believe, I believe just at first blush, and again, this is not binding, but this would be an example of the creation of production capacity um, and therefore would be um, an, an an eligible an, an eligible use. Uh, again, we would have to see the entire application in order to make that determination. But um, this, I think, is an example of, you know, there's expanded ca production capacity and then there's the creation of production capacity. And I and I think it, it looks like this would be the the creation of um, production capacity. Does that um, does that answer your question, Judy? As much as I'm able to. Okay, great. Let's move on. Uh, let's see, Bobby, for, for, for facility expansion requiring site construction, shall we assume that prevailing wage will apply? Uh, I, uh, Holly, please chime in if I get this, um, if I get this wrong. I, I believe that construction projects over 750,000, uh, with public resources, uh, would mean that prevailing wage apply, applies. Is that right? I, that might be something we need to circle back on because we're still looking into that, but Holly? Yeah, definitely. We, um, we need to do some more research on this area. So we didn't mention this because we don't really know what projects are out there. So I think the answer to this is it, it depends. It depends on uh, the activities that we plan to do. Um, we are going to look into this more with some help from our attorney and, and possibly somebody from the board and several issues and clarifying guidance about this very important. Great, great question, Bobby. Thank you for that. And we will um we will get an answer. Okay, Matt, section 2.3. Yay, you, you read it, Matt. Yay. Uh, sorry. Uh, section 2.3 states successful applicants will be expected to accept and prioritize these types of orders when they are received. Non-compliance with prioritization requirements may result in a reduction of grant funds or termination of a grant. Uh, an uh, agency may notify Oregon Emergency Management, as well as other state agencies and local government entities of awarded companies who have agreed to prioritize production in these areas. Can you clarify what agreement will be put in place and what the definition of prioritization is? Um, well, I think the, um, hmm, let's see, uh, Matt, do you mind um, coming off mute and and ask and clarifying that a little bit, your question a little bit more? Uh, yeah, so I think there's just that verbiage in there, obviously rightfully so due to the funds. So I just wanted clarification of what an applicant could expect based off of these requirements, because obviously uh, the grant awards are anticipated to go to um, for-profit businesses. So how is it, how's the state expecting or what would that process look like if the manufacturing facility hypothetically was running at capacity and they receive an emergency order from the state? Um, what is the readiness response time and how, how does that get prioritization and um I, I i don't know the verbiage in that category uh just left a little to be imagined so i wanted to make sure everyone was aware of what those requirements would be set forth and what that might look like yeah i'll take a i'll take a stab and then rick please please chime in um we leave that part of the um uh, of, of the requirements in the applicant's court, so to speak. We want to hear from you how you would plan to prioritize an order from those prioritization categories. We want to know, um, you know, what, what that would mean for your business, what that looks like. Um, that's why we are notifying um, potential future partners of the uh, grantees' information so that if a natural disaster occurs, if, you know, um, a development uh, organization, development partner wants to do a, a master planned community of 
uh, lower or middle income um, homes with all modular, then they know who to go to. Um, so I think it's I think it's something that applicants will have to think through themselves and and ask whether or not they want to, um, it, whether or not that prioritization is something they're ready to do, they're ready to comply with because it is so explicit in the bill language that we. Uh, it it has to be a requirement upon um, receiving these receiving these funds, but we do leave some. Um, I don't know if creativity is the right word, but we leave it a little open ended so that you can tell us what that um, what what that would mean for for your business, what it looks like for you to to prioritize those categories. Yeah, and I'll just jump in and say yeah, it's intentionally vague because uh, and you'll notice it's a scored category as well. So we every business is potentially handles this a little differently that doesn't make it right or wrong um and then so we're scoring it but we're also making it a minimum criteria so if you're ignoring it or not doing it then you're not meeting the intent of the bill and you will not move forward um, as an applicant okay yeah thank you for that clarification so it will be addressed per application is the process that's intended Okay. Um, while I'm asking questions on off of mute real quick, I was going to ask, like, uh, we are involved a lot with OHCS for uh, low income projects, affordable housing projects throughout the state of Oregon. Um, so this is a definitely a unique opportunity. So um, it, thank you for bringing this on. But I did want to kind of follow up Would the process of grant awarded funds be through a conventional like OHCS structured loan setup that's forgivable at a certain period? Or is it truly intended to be a, a true grant? It's it's a true grant. Yeah, we're not able to loan general fund um, resources. There are a lot of really boring um, uh, sort of sp specific. The, the complexity of, of general fund is not something I, I'm going to bore everybody with. But um, because of the deadline to spend the, the funds at the end of the biennium, a uh, loan uh, would not make sense. So we're, that's why we're doing the, um, we're, we're taking the grant route. So it is a true grant. It has to be a grant. Yeah. So it, it's, we don't even have an option in it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Let's see. Let's move on to, I think Stevens is next. To follow up on Matt's question as an example, if you're in production of a middle income or low income project and there's a natural disaster, is the applicant required to pivot manufacturing midstream? Um, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I think uh, the order of the prioritized categories, one is uh, a natural disaster, uh, and then it's uh, low income, and then it's middle income, middle income housing. Um, I think that's the, the sort of um, the level of complexity. And that is something that we, uh, we should maybe look a little bit closer uh, at, I don't know, Rick, do you, I said, yeah, I, I just, I, I want to go back and just, you know, answer it like we did before, you know, prioritization is something we're leaving to you. So how you determine to prioritize these things is something that, you know, you're going to tell us what works best for your industry, what works best for your company. And we will make a determination as to whether or not that fits with the bill structure and score that. So, um, we're going to leave how prioritization happens with your industry up to you and you tell us what what that's going to look like good question thank you Stephen. oh and sorry you said that it was answered above so sorry about that i missed i missed that thank you Stephen. um any other questions anyone else who wants to come off mute um we have about uh 25 more minutes left I just want to thank you all for your interest. Um, we're really excited to have uh, this many folks on the call and be interested in these funds. Uh, we wish we had enough money to provide everybody that's interested uh, with with a grant to to expand uh, their capacity and and, um, and production. We don't have that, uh, but we are really you know, really excited about your interest and look forward to your great applications. I'm sure all your projects are worthy. I um will hang on 
in uncomfortable silence for a few more minutes, just in case some more questions uh, come to you. Uh, and I will try not to fill it with chatter. So um, let's just hang on the line for a couple more minutes in case, uh, in case there are any other questions. I have a little chatter. Just kind of Matt, just one more thing for you. Um, if you take a look at attachment A in the RFA documents, there's a, that's a sample grant agreement. So you can see the agreement, um, what the, what we intend to enter into. Again, you're welcome to uh, submit comments or questions about the content or the terms and take exception to any of those things. But that's the document that we intend to ultimately sign with our grantees. Okay, looks like Julie asks, uh, who is reviewing the applications? Uh, there will be uh, OHCS staff and a couple of um, external um, external partners who will be on the scoring panel. Uh, we're still firming up those commitments because the, as you probably saw with the the timeline, the scoring period falls over some some holidays. So we're um, so we're working to make sure that the folks that we have invited on the panel have the have the ability to get those get that scoring done um, before um, uh, within within the within the window that we've identified. I'll add one more thing. Um, I know we've, we've got some areas that we're still researching and some of your questions have caused us to um, want to provide more clarification. Um, I, I don't want people to go away thinking that, you know, at, at, no, at any point in time, this may change. So back to that schedule timeline, um, our answers to questions and, and clarifications, we're going to try to provide all of that by December 5th. So after that's done, that should be a pretty, you should, you should be rest assured that we're not going to change anything else and it's safe to um, develop your application with the information you have at that time. Okay, Michelle asks, can public agencies apply for these grants? Curious about Klamath County being on this pre-app. Um, I, I, I don't, See why not? Again, if you're um, if you're doing a partnership, there will have to be an identity, an entity identified to do the insurance and uh, who will be responsible for reporting. Um, but uh, if if uh, you can demonstrate that that partnership and the activities that you're planning to pursue will expand production, expand or create production capacity, then um, that should that should work. Uh, will we be able to submit questions to you after this meeting? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Holly's, I'm going to just put the slide back on the screen of Holly's contact information. All, all questions should go to Holly at this point. Um, just give me one quick second. We'll get that pulled up. Or actually, Holly, I'm just going to put your email address in the chat. Okay, um, you're with economic development. Okay, great. Let's see, Gust uh asks can you speak to 4b on attachment c staff funding parameters um gus can you um what what exactly are you hoping for us to speak to sorry it took me a second to get off there oh no um, problem 4B, uh it says identi identification of roles and responsibilities for any staff proposed to be funded by a grant 
So I was just wondering where that started and stopped, or is is that something that's going to be per per application? It it will be a per application. I think we want an idea of of um, the staff who will be working on the activities associated with the grant. Holly, is there anything I missed? Anything I missed there? Or uh, no, this is in relation to the the budget narrative. So that's just one of the things. If you're proposing to fund staff, yeah, we're just asking if there was a responsibility. Thanks for the question, Gust. Any other any other questions? Okay, Michelle asks, how will you reconcile the scoring between an out-of-state company wanting to open an Oregon facility and an Oregon company wanting to create a production capacity? Um, I think it will just, the the strength of the application, um, the, um, the projected uh, production capacity expansion or, or creation. Um, maybe, Michelle, maybe you can come off mute and explain a little bit more about what you mean by reconcile. Hi. Again, oh, Hi. sorry, go ahead. I'm here. I'm here. Um, I'm just kind of looking at like, there's no specific points for that. Like to what extent is applicant ready to implement its proposed solution? Um, I mean, so I guess everyone will, there's nothing specifically in the points, I would say that that parse out that kind of a situation. Right. So it sounds like you'll really just be looking at the strengths of the applicants. You're not, you're not assigning, you're also not assigning, um, I guess that to what extent is applicant ready to implement, we'll just have to make the case. If we are creating production, whether that production is coming here from out of state or whether that is from an Oregon company wanting to create that. Is that correct? That's right. I, okay. I would say, Rick, um, Holly, any? Yeah, I don't know that we, I mean, we didn't distinguish an in-state with that. Bottom line is we want the money in the state. So whether they're currently in state or going to be in state, uh, really we're, we're letting the application speak for itself. So so then will the staff funding also require that those be Oregon jobs, not jobs that are at the home office, things like that? That would be our expectation, correct. Okay, thank you. These are great questions. Thank you, everybody. We have about 15 minutes left. So kind of going tailwinding on that. So under the ineligible uses, it says uh, include, but aren't limited to it. And it specifically says personal expenses or personnel expenses. I can't remember. Um, so, but someone just asked the question about applying grant funds in that section C towards it almost sounded like wages of personnel. So the way we are reading the application is it's not intended to go to hiring efforts or to pay wages of staff. It's intended to go towards increasing production or facility improvements to create a product. Uh, so could you clarify on that? And then the last section is it very specifically says that direct investments in equipment or personnel that would not result in newer expanded products in Oregon. So it's like very specific that it has to be Oregon. So I don't know. Um, I think Michelle, you guys might want to look at the exclusions a little deeper. Um, Matt, I'll take the first question first. I think um, what you're referring to was personal expenses, um, uh, okay. not personnel expenses. Now we want to be clear. This is not a workforce um this is not a workforce grant. We, but we also recognize that you're going to have to pay folks in order to, uh, you know, and associate for their role and associated activities with the grant. Um, but it is not meant to um, be a workforce grant. Um, Rick, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, yeah. Just that, that? you know, if you're expanding production, you may have expanded 
costs <laughs> with with staff with that and we we anticipate that that's okay um it we're not this isn't designed to just hire staff that what we're really trying to get out of this is production so what whatever you need to expand that production we're willing to pay for um through the grant just know that when the five million ends you're you know that's why we want to see what happens in five years from now as well um how are you going to continue that will your you know increased revenue eventually pay for those those personnel or what or what's going to have happen there um, but yes, uh, uh, personnel is 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 okay. But what at the end of the day, what we're looking for is production. Okay, well, I appreciate that because that's not how I read it. So I apologize. <laughs> oh no, no apology necessary. This this we're glad to provide some clarification. Yeah, I think Matt, what you're referring to the personal expenses, we just wanted to ensure that. Um, entities were not backfilling um, debts or things that uh, would cover their own their own per personal ex expenses that that would not be um, that that would not be an eligible use of the um, of the funds. Thank you for the question. Okay, we are, I think, um, at the end of our time together. We have a, about ten minutes left, but I think we've, um, I think we've reached as many questions as we're going to receive. Again, this is not your last opportunity. Please reach out to Holly if you have, um, if you have any additional questions that come up as you go through your application, and um, we sincerely appreciate the time today, the interest in the grant the production of, of housing for Oregonians um, and uh, look forward to connecting with you and reviewing your applications. Thanks everybody. Thank you.